attending to the basic self-care of life, that eating, sleeping, exercise. When you do that, you're so much more able to handle your spouse's nuances and idiosyncrasies, and you even find them more adorable and cute. Well, hey everyone, welcome back to what is almost the last episode of 2023. I cannot believe it, but my Christmas decorations are up. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's celebrate. And if you're like me, the holidays are wonderful, but they can also be stressful. It can be hard on relationships. It can be hard on your marriage. And so I wanted to bring you a guest that I know is not only to give you hope and encouragement through the holidays, but to launch 2024 thriving instead of striving in your marriage. So this episode is for you. So lean in. I'm here today with Krista Harden, MA. She's a relationship expert. She's an author, as well as the host of the popular Enneagram and Marriage podcast. Krista has been working with and researching marriage for two decades. She provides hope for couples who are struggling to find their light, their love, and their mission together in any season of relationship. I love that so much. Her most recent Amazon best-selling book is The Enneagram in Marriage, Your Guide to Thriving Together in Your Unique Pairing. So we're going to talk about practical ways that we can better understand and support each other. So welcome, Krista. I'm so honored to have you here on the Make Life Matter podcast. Thank you so much, Angela. I am so happy to be here with you all. We've been trying to do this for a while and I feel like anything that could go wrong, my camera's not working. Like it's just always something, but we're doing it. We're making it happen because I just, I just know how difficult the holidays can be on our relationships, especially our marriages. And it's sad that it is that way. Maybe that you can even lean into that in a minute and tell us why we think that is and what we can do. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about yourself. You might be new to some of our listeners And how helping others thrive in marriage has become not only your passion, but your profession. Talk a little bit about your education and and why this is so important to you. Oh, thank you, Angela. That is my joy to talk about because I honestly have had this as a calling in my life since I was actually a little girl. I would help my parents troubleshoot marriage issues. Mm. And I know that's not healthy or orthodox, but it worked for us because it was peaceful when I could help them as a third party who is just troubleshooting from the backseat after ski club or whatever I was coming mm-hmm. home from. And it was such a joy to see my parents light up and just laugh a little bit and the car and the mood get lighter. And they'd say, you know, she's going to be a lawyer one day or something. She's really Aww. good at this. And so I really have great memories of just allowing each of them to see one another's perspectives. And I did the same thing with friends and literally had them lay on my bed and typed progress notes. And then I decided, of course, and especially as I got to know God better, uh, oh my gosh, I can pair my faith with this helping gift that I have. And so I went to undergrad for communication as well as psychology. And then I went to Wheaton College and got my master's in clinical psych to really make it official, to go the marriage and family route, and to really get an integrative program that would help me to be able to navigate not only the best of marriage research, but integrate my faith. And and then later Enneagram came along to nuance it farther so that we could even hit personality type. Because like you said, I know the holidays are hard for couples. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that is, Crystal? Like what makes them so difficult? Is it just that my husband and I pastored for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. As I'm asking you, I'm thinking, you know, some things are already there. The issues are there. The communication issues are there. The resentments could be there. And maybe the holidays just accentuates them. Or is it because people are spending more time together or what are your, or just more pressure around, you know, holiday seasons or what are your thoughts? Well, I think you're right when you say, is it a myriad of things? And it is. But I think that when we look at early marriage, the biggest strain is usually a a perceived incompatibility of temperament. And we'll be talking about that today and helping you guys with that. But also in the holidays, we have the second most common reason in early marriage that people divorce, and that's the extended family stuff. So we'll, you know, want to be working on boundaries with that. And then also later, it's lack of intimacy, lack of connection and the affairs 
layers start coming in. So it's harder. People get more desperate. And then let's last layer here. And there's probably even more culturally, but my husband is a medical provider and he was reminding me in late November that the reason we were both getting more calls about people having panic is that the light changes in the Northern hemisphere and we're just all having less light and our bodies are struggling to adapt to that. And they feel a little bit more depressed this time of year. That's so interesting because my family and even I just went to like pop in a store the other day on Black Friday and someone said, oh my goodness, it just feels like it's 10 o'clock at night because daylight savings mm-hmm. has happened and it's like so dark so early. So yes. you know, think about like the, just the physiological effects, emotional, relational effects that, that can mm-hmm. have yes. um, on your body, your mind, your emotions. You feel tired. You just feel a little kind of off Kilter, yes. like for us, our weather changed overnight and it's freezing. I'm fighting a cold. So you're right. All those things can, can contribute. And then you have all these expectations, other people's expectations, like you mentioned, extend family. And so that's why we need this. We need this so desperately. Yes. So, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the Enneagram because you, I love that you said this is an integration of faith for you. Some people don't understand the Enneagram. Some people have yeah. a a negative interpretation of the Enneagram or some people are just all in and everything is the Enneagram. So (laughs) help us find the healthy balance here. And why was this, like you said, it was, it it added something to your existing practice. It gave you another way of, of maybe interpreting and helping and providing guidance. But for those that are listening that are maybe even a little skeptical or maybe even opposed to the Enneagram, what encouragement would you have for those of us that are strong believers and also see the value of how understanding personality types can make such a difference? Oh, it's such a good question. And I think it's a question that even those who responsibly use the Enneagram should ask themselves, just as we would want to ask about any tool we would bring into our marriages. And that is, is this an idol? Is this evil? And absolutely the Enneagram is not an evil tool. It's just a tool. And I'm sure just as in medicine or any science, we've had people use things to make nuclear bombs or to cure cancer. So can we use a tool like the Enneagram? And so can we help people when we just learn how to use it for personality alone to say, okay, well, we are all, you know, dealing with relationship issues. But when you divide people into nine different brackets of struggling with various personality temperaments, it can actually help us to nuance what are the issues I might be experiencing in my marriage versus the next couple over. And that really gives you a leg up on working on particulars because we're not just married to general people. We're married to somebody with their own internal ways of working through the world. So what I found practically speaking was that all the assessments I had learned in the prior years were bulky and that this one just was a bit more sleek, elegant, easy to use, and we could get down to the bottom of the issue. So it's not really about the Enneagram. It's what does learning your type teach you about yourself? Maybe you learned, oh yeah, I haven't, you know, I I learned I'm a peacemaker type nine, But then I also realized underneath that was I don't often feel hurt in my marriage. So we don't really stick with the Enneagram. We learn what's underneath the issue. And then we have a faster way to work on the marriage because people don't want to go through, you know, many, many, many sessions. If possible, they'd rather do the work a little bit sooner and get results a little bit quicker. No, I love, I love seeing it as a tool and seeing it as a starting place for, yeah, this is the way I'm kind of wired and hardwired. And that could be. Sadly, from trauma, from different things in our past, maybe we um, chip away at those things with the help of the Holy Spirit and we realize, okay, I could respond more healthy, um, healthily in different situations and environments. So, because the goal here, Krista, is we want, we want healthy marriages. We want thriving marriages instead of striving. And I remember my husband and I growing up, you know, the love languages book was really popular and I'm in grad school and we do a strengths assessment. And so I'm super used to all of these tools and Again, we don't want to, you said, use them responsibly. We don't want to, um, oh, okay, that's just the way I am. So I don't have to grow and yeah. walk with the Lord. We're not saying <laughs> that. We're not trying to put anyone in a box. We're saying, look, we are all uniquely designed by God. Um, yeah. But I have different skill sets and spiritual gifts and makeup and personality yeah. and response you know, mechanisms. And so understanding that can make such a difference for people. Yeah. So you mentioned the nine um, different types that are identified in the Enneagram. I, I align cl- most closely to one. 
Um, and then there's wings and there's all these kind of, you know, more complex approaches to it, but yeah. can you give us kind of a quick bird's eye view of, um, what that looks like of these different Enneagram types? Yes, absolutely. So we all, of course, I love how you said we're more than just our types, Angela, and we can even nuance farther and you could go into, like you said, wings, arrows, tri-types, but for those who just want the general view on the types, the nine types are basically, like you said, type one perfectionist slash improver reformer, somebody who's really good at seeing the details. Type twos are helpers and givers primarily. They just love to give. That's their favorite way to feel loved and to give love. Type threes are achievers, performers. They feel amazing when they're gloriously achieving out there and just sharing beautifully. Type fours are people of depth and they can sometimes have melancholy, but there's this creative artistry about a four that allows them to sit with people in their pain. Type fives are the innovators, often very introverted because they have limited energy, but just really enjoy researching and finding things out who done it. Uh, type sixes are very good at security, loyalty, and troubleshooting. Type sevens are joyful enthusiasts. They love to make the world more positive and lighter. Type eights are protectors, challengers, and really like to defend their people and the underdog. And then last, the one I mentioned, the nines are peacemakers. They're very good at mediating, don't always feel heard, but their voice often has really good perspective because they're so thoughtfully listening to others. So there's pros and cons of each, of course, but these nine ways of seeing the world are sort of like the gifts we hear about in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, when we hear just before the love verses that we commonly use in marriage in 1 Corinthians 13, we're reminded we each have a different gift, but we need the whole body to work well together. Yeah, that's good. It's a good way to look at it. And you might've just kind of identified yourself or your spouse, if you're married and listening and, and that kind of quick rundown, as you were saying, Krista, when I did this strengths finder for um, a class I had in grad school, that was very heavily on all kind of testing, spiritual t gifts test and per personality. I mean, just things I'd never even taken before it was a lot. Yeah. I, I was surprised that achiever was very high for me. I, I mm. used, I call myself a recovering perfectionist. I hate, mm. you know, that kind of drive toward perfection, but I would say that maybe I've even morphed a little bit. I, I might be more of a three, but I've identified myself as a one. Um, and that's just been a very quick identification. I haven't done a whole lot of research into it, but and, you know, for people who feel like they need to be achieving and I'm a very much a visionary, but my husband is as well, but he's also a peacemaker and he's a great mm -hmm. mediator. He's got his masters of divinity and he's a wonderful oh, counselor. Oh, and, God. you know, so I, I feel like when you understand each other better, I know that he's going to probably put my feet on the ground at times when I'm like out yeah. in the stratosphere, thinking of a new idea and vision brainstorming. And he might say, I don't know if that's wisdom for you right now, or, you know, I tend to be the adventurer and planning the trips for our family or, you know, growing up or, um, you know, I just think it, it's, it's been neat to complement each other rather than compete with each oh, other. And there's so many marriages that we just see mm -hmm. that are competing. It's, it's just yes. it's, it's painful. It's painful to see, and we can be mm -hmm. thriving instead of striving. So mm -hmm. let's talk about some of the practical ways, Krista, that you would suggest that people that use their Enneagram knowledge, plus you probably want to encourage them to just start with knowing what type they are and then um, using that knowledge to better understand and support our partners and our spouses. Yes. So I really recommend, I have a lot of free items on my website. And one thing I recommend is for you to go to enneagramandmarriage.com. That's my site. And I have a free typing guide there. I also have a free 40 page guide there for you to just really look together with your mate or yourself to just see what you think your type is. Just read about each one. And one of them will probably feel a little bit like I'm reading your mail, like, oh, yep, that's me. I, I'm good at this and I struggle with this. And then once you know that type, I think it invites you to look at what your spouse has been saying about you with a little bit more grace because typically people have this thing called the fundamental attribution error, which means we think that we're just a bit healthier than our spouse. And that when we make mistakes, it's because we're tired or we have a cold or it's because we, you know, just had some trauma. But when they make a mistake, we attribute it more to like, oh, you're just bad and wrong. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. when you look at your own type and you see your vices, you're like, oh yeah. Like, and then there's this humility and compassion that comes 
for your spouse that you didn't have before. So it's just a nice place to start. Even if your spouse doesn't need to do that test with you or look at the types, you just already benefited your marriage so much. And then you can also look at your spouse's gifts a little bit differently too, because you're probably content on looking at their flaws if you're past the honeymoon years. And it's nice to be able to revisit what do I love about my spouse? Oh yeah, they have this gift. So I'm going to celebrate that more too. So that's a good starting place is celebrate your spouse, come in with some humility about your own struggles, but also of course, love yourself. I love that. And I think rather than just, you got to change, you got to change. Sure. Yeah. If we have he- unhealthy, destructive, toxic patterns, um, behaviors, of course we need right. to, um, with the help of the Holy spirit, not just say, Oh, well, that's just the way I am. Right. But at the same time, we can understand one another better. Hey, my husband processes things differently than I do. He right. takes more time to mm-hmm. analyze it and come up with the way the next step. And sometimes he'll say, can I have some time to think about that? But then, you know, okay, well then let's put a timeline on it or it might not ever get done. So, and vice versa, you might say, okay, I want you to slow your roll a little bit. So I think it's not like you need to change. I want to change you, but it's, I want to understand you. I truly do. I want to understand the way you're seeing the world. And that, like you said, that gives us grace and compassion. So what if we do, what do you encourage us to do, Krista? If you realize that, okay, I'm married to someone who, we have really different personalities and we're rubbing against each other. We're just not, it's just the gears are grinding and we're striving instead of thriving because we can, there are Enneagram types that don't necessarily bring out the best in each other. So yeah. what do you do when you find like that might be the case? Cause you don't want to throw in the towel. You want to make the, the, the steps to remedy those situations and, and to do life together in a healthier way. I love that question because I the think that a lot of, of the time, are, the people ask me like, will be. what so is the best type together or are there any healthy bad types? Terms and I do want to let you know, I'm keeping your window of tolerance open. And this is why I'm going to start with you on this one. I And I heard the question about when they grade on you, but when you have a healthy relationship window of tolerance, that means you're trying to get sleep. You're trying to decently get good nutrition and fitness, and you're trying to make sure that you are allowing yourself stretching and really just attending to the basic self-care of life, that eating, sleeping, exercise. When you do that, you're so much more able to handle your spouse's nuances and idiosyncrasies. And you even find them more adorable and cute. And when you see their Enneagram best gifts, instead of just focusing on those worst things, you can say, oh my gosh, I forgot that they were such a wonderful artist. Here I was thinking about how they delve into melancholy, but look at their beautiful creations. Or I forgot that, yes, they can be very verbose and talk so much, but they're bringing joy to others in their seven or their eight and they're protecting others. So I want you to start telling yourself a different inner script about your spouse, because couples who show up the best on research are couples who tell great narratives about their spouse. They know the worst parts. It isn't that they're blind to those, but they are able to say, I get good self-care and I'm able to celebrate my spouse's gifts more than I think about their struggles and my internal narrative is more one of gratitude. So your spouse, you're empowered right now as a listener. It's not about your spouse changing. It's about you changing the way you think and feel about them. And of course, lastly, within this, definitely make your request for what you want to see, but you can't control somebody. So if you want to have more date nights, instead of saying, you never take me on a date, Mm. you could say, you know, we work so hard. We really deserve a date night. Or I would love a date night this week. That doesn't say anything bad about them. And people grow through encouragement. So these are just a few tips to really get you going. And I think they're going to help you a lot this holiday. Oh, that's so helpful, Krista. And if you need to just step back and say, oh, right now, I'm not understanding them or the way they're wired. And, you know, we have two grown adult kids now. So even understanding, uh, you know, how they see the world and how they, they, they react very differently to things. It can help when, you know, holidays, family reunions are together. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you said, positive intent. I've thought of it as positive intent, negative intent, but you used a different phrase. I didn't jot it down. So can you, can you share it again? Window of something remind me of that. I said relationship window of tolerance because okay, we hear so a lot about that. Yeah, yeah that's window. a new phrase for me and it might be for my listeners. So can you help us unpack that just a little bit more? 
Yes. Well, I really hear the phrase window of tolerance a lot lately in trauma circles and therapy circles. And, and so I add the word relationship window of tolerance to that because I am a huge believer that when you're taking good care of you, you're able to do so much better in your relationship. Just like if any of you have babies or remember the baby years, remember how like when they were tired and they were hungry and they were dysregulated, like you knew as a parent, there's no way they're going to be happy walking through the store. There's no way we're going to get through this meal. You would cancel things because you knew they had to have their basic self-care. What happens? as adults is for some reason, we think that we're invincible and that we're not at all affected by our bodies. But we've seen too many studies show us the brain body connection. So when I say relationship window of tolerance, I'm reminding everyone you're here within a body on this side of heaven, you do have a body and you have to show accountability for that. So being a good steward here means guess what? Good news. You get to take better care of you. So if you've got some issues with your spouse, first say to each other, you know what, like we have some things to work out, but first let's make sure we're, let's get a good night of rest before we talk this out. Let's, let's really be fair to ourselves and our issue here that we are also, you know, getting a nice, maybe we do a walk and talk to get some of that endorphins or dopamine going. Maybe we make sure that we're not crashing from sugar and holiday eating. And we just give ourselves the grace to be well, to have these conversations. And then you'll be so much more well charged instead of on E or batteries empty for the important conversations you you do deserve to have. No, that's just so helpful, Krista. I mean, like you said, we, we sometimes want to point the finger at the other and it's, it's our own issue. It's our own lack of self-care or regulation or boundaries, or, Mm -hmm. I mean, we've talked about grad school. I've been in grad school and traveling and pastoring. I mean, it can, it can wear you out. And so when I'm weary, I'm easily overstimulated. I'm I get crabby, you know, in those settings instead of gracious. And, and sometimes instead of withdrawing, I will just get even more, more extrovert, more extroverted and more irritated, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And so that's just so unfair to, to others around me. And really to me to feel like, okay, this is just a seasonal issue. Mm -hmm. Um, Instead of, like you said, look at what they're trying to do. They're trying to help, or they're trying to do this or that. And our own lens, if you would say it that way is blurry. And so the way we're looking at it is not an accurate filter. Now, obviously Krista is by no means, or am I excusing just, you know, inappropriate, un- unacceptable behavior. We're not saying right. that, we're just saying the normal things that can, can just rub us the wrong way about a spouse, or we just find ourselves kind of quiet from each other and resentful and the intimacy is gone. Um, you know, to be honest, because Chris, let's be frank. I mean, these conversations are not always easy. Like we just want to keep on trucking and hope it's just going to all work out, but we need to do the the hard work of relationships. Why do you feel like that's so important? I feel like it's so important because people want to have the ideals without putting the work in and you can't go to the gym and just automatically have that great body any more than you can just automatically wave a magic wand and have a great marriage. Now we did say starting your self-care and healthy thinking will get you a lot of the way. But what will also get you there is being brave to say, here's what I want. Like I said, you know, putting it out there so that your spouse knows they're never going to know unless you tell them. And some of the personality types, this is where personality type can really come in, like nines, twos, and sevens, for instance, the helpers, the encouragers, and these peacemakers, sometimes they don't want to tell because they're like, I want to be positive. I want to say nice things, Mm. but you have to share what's really going on underneath. And that way your spouse will want to more serve you and give to you if you tell them in a kind way what you want. But if you're nagging or on the other hand, if you're not saying it, no one's going to know. So healthy couples talk about conflicts, but they do so by expressing what they want or possibly also a complaint and maybe even a dream behind the complaint. Like I always hoped for this when I was a kid, Um, but they don't do it as a criticism of the person's entire ego structure. They don't say you're bad, you're wrong, you never, you always. Yeah, that's so good. It's so good to to keep the issue at hand in an objective objective language rather than you're this, you're that. 
Um, it's hard when feelings are escalated. We it just, is hard. We go over the jugulars, but like you said, <laughs> if, if we can talk about those things when we're really calm, when we're rested, when we're in a good headspace, a good mindset, to listen, can we talk about this, you know, procrastination, or can we talk about whatever the issue is on the table? And if they're really, really uh, big issues that are just feeling like you're not making progress. Krista, when do people need to know it might be time to go seek out in our case, maybe our, a pastor, like we are yes. a, a, a licensed therapist, mm. a medical help, because we, I'm not, I'm not by any means saying, don't go get the book and don't go start yeah. here, but you may, yeah. you may realize your marriage needs more help than that. Yes. I think that's a great question, Angela, because I don't want you to feel like you have to do this alone. And it's so important. Community is part of the process and the healthiest couples we see in research have community, even just another couple to bounce things off of, oh, we're not alone. That helps people. Now, of course, if there are poor boundaries, you've got to make sure you have good boundaries with other couples. But in general, I think it's best to approach a helper when you feel like you can't get there on your own. You've tried the things out that you You've heard generally from me here today, they're not working and you're like, I need some intense care for us. I'm not making it. And I want you to remember rest is okay. Quitting, not so okay. You know, once in a while it's the right time and we can't save every marriage, but most of the time with rest and with good tools, you will be able to get through. So just make sure you reach out. And I also want to name that the person you pick really matters. The fit is one of the most important pieces of finding a good helper. So make sure you really do your research and find somebody from an accredited marriage and family therapy program or somebody you trust that's a coach or like you, Angela, somebody who's a great pastoral team so that you can really make sure you're in good hands as you start sharing. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. You're not alone. We don't want you suffering. Yeah. You know, many years ago, my husband, and I went through a series of, of two weeks of counseling at a center that's more designed for, for uh, pastors and their wives. And it was one of the best things we ever did. So oh. we're strong advocates for not waiting to take a marriage class or not waiting to yeah. read a book on marriage until like, there's mm. just, you know, the fabric is completely frayed in your marriage. And I think sometimes we think, oh, if I go to that marriage class, everyone's going to think my marriage is in trouble. No, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you mm. go to that, you should at least go to the doctor for your annual checkups and your yeah. proactive care, which is back to that self-care that Chris is talking about is we have to be proactive in our own emotional, mental, relational, physical help. And if we're not, then we're going to find ourselves trying to play catch up, trying to fix something that is in a worse condition than it needs to be. Mm. So understanding yes. the way you're wired, understand that God uniquely designed you and you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are dearly loved by your father who created you. Yes. Now, yes, we live in a fallen world. So things get messed up and we don't respond and react in healthy patterns all the time. And so these tools, these resources, like this brand new book that Chris is providing for us are so needed. The Enneagram in Marriage, your guide to thriving together in your unique pairing. So rather than, well, I should have never married you and this and that, but no, let's think about, I'm, I'm so thankful God brought us together uniquely to thrive instead of striving. And Chris is going to pray for us in just a second, but Krista, I want people to know how they can find a copy of, of this amazing resource and many other resources. Like you said, your free guide and mm -hmm. they're um, at your site. And then I'm going to ask you one last question before we close out today. Of course, it's been my honor to be here. Thank you. I would love for you to get in touch with me at enneagramandmarriage.com because there's a link to the book there. There's a link to the podcast that I have every week for you. There's a link to my membership, my classes. And in January, I'll be starting a five session class online that you can watch from Zoom at home if you just need that extra, if you want to walk through my book with me personally. And that is always fun to see the the person on the other side of the podcast. So just make sure you know that we also have coaches that are certified through everything I learned at Wheaton and more. And I just love to be able to share because I know that there are so many people in need out there. So yes, find me at enneagramandmarriage.com. I love that. And I didn't know you were doing that, that Zoom yes. session, doing it with you. How exciting. Yes. What a better way to walk through this than with the author herself. So oh. 
Krista, yeah. thank you. Thank you for making this your life's passion, just to see our marriages matter for the kingdom. And, uh, you know, it's one of the, the, the most, um, important relationships in our life to the Lord. And if you're single and you're listening and you desire marriage, or you just want to desire a greater understanding of the relationships in your life, this book will, will definitely help you and bless you and encourage you. So get a copy for yourself, get a copy for your spouse. I know you will be like, Oh yeah, you gave me a marriage book, but Hey, we want, we want our marriages to be healthy and read it yourself first. If you want your spouse to read it and let them know that it's important to you as well to be the best as, as Chris has encouraged us work on ourselves. That's yes. really what we have the power to do and not just be so irritated and frustrated and trying to change mm. the house that God has given us. So thank you, Chris. It's such great insight and practical steps today, but I love to close yeah. with one last question. We've talked about so many different yeah. ways we can make our marriage matter, but other than Jesus in the Bible, who is that person for you that makes and inspires you to make your life matter? Oh my gosh, this is such a fun question. I think and if we're talking about just which scriptures bring me to life the most, it's going to be Philippians. But as for a biblical archetype heroine that I love, I love Deborah of the Old Testament. She's not often seen. She's a judge. So she gets to talk with people about their problems and decide. But she also has a marriage and her husband is respected. And yet she goes around and she lives a life that is pretty drama free as she listens to the Lord, obeys him and leads her people out of captivity. So she's always a great example of me, of a, to me, of a strong woman who's also gracious and kind and loving. And I think, like I said, we don't get to, to hear about her as much, but she's a great leader that we can all learn from. I love her. She's amazing. Oh, she's amazing. I shared a message on her Oh. At um uh Mother's Day one year at our church, I Ooh. just think she's extraordinary. I mean, there's so many people in the Bible that we can draw inspiration from. But like you said, she's one who understood her gift mix. She understood that she needed people around her that had skills and strengths uh, that she did not have, and it took community. She yes. was doing one role. JL was in a, in a yes a role in that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know uh. uh Barack, I was going to say Boaz. I'm like, that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Barack was doing his part. So it takes all of us, like you said, a body of believers mm -hmm. and not resenting others for the way God has designed them, but welcoming that. Obviously there may be people that you get along with better personalities yeah. that click better, but we can honor one another, regardless of whether or not that is going to be our best friend or our spouse, understanding each other is, is such a starting place and I can do better. We can all do better in this. So Krista, thank you so much. And I'm just going to ask if you would pray over our listeners, because there might be someone listening whose marriage is really struggling. Um, and they, they have just been maybe even feeling discouraged or knowing what to do. And I just, I just really believe that today is giving them encouragement to know that there's hope and mm. that there's actual, some practical tools that they can do to have the marriage that their heart so desires. I would love for you to pray over our listeners as we close. Yeah. Oh, I would love to. Thank you, Angela. God, would you please be with every listener here? Father, you know the person listening right now who needs help. You know your son, your daughter, this family, Lord, these families that are crying out to you for what to do next, Father. I pray that something from today's episode would truly be encouraging to them and they would already be able to take that and run towards health and healing and joy and peace in their relationship because of it. I pray that that little spark of hope that we planted today would show up so big and beautifully and be a new seed planted in their family for the kingdom for eternity, that they and their spouse could begin to find how their gifts shine together for your kingdom and glory and to make this world brighter, Lord, as you say in Matthew 5, that we could shine our light for all the world to see. So I just pray that you would encourage every listener to truly find that together with us and we would grow all together as a kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.